gather on this first Sunday in Advent uh, at Zion Lutheran Church. And for all who are joining us by way of oh so many ways, we're glad that you're with us uh, this Sunday. Oh. Mike is on, but the mute, that's the story of my life. How's that? So let me start over. Hello and welcome to worship. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, there are some that are gathered here today, just a few, and one drinks a Diet Coke while I uh, lead worship, and um, she wonders how I do it without Diet Coke. I used to drink a lot of it, and now I drink no caffeine. She wonders how I do it. Well, you can see what happens when I don't. So this is the first Sunday in Advent. A wonderful, beautiful season, and so um, in the midst of all the chaos that's going on in the uh, in the community and in the world, uh, we gather for just a few minutes to to be centered again around God's amazing grace for us. As the people of God, we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we mourn with those who mourn. This week we mourn for the family of Larry Hausman who died this last week and also for the family of Cynthia, the mother of Sharon Hendricks. Please keep these families in your prayers in these days. Uh, death is a hard thing already, but in the midst of all of this, it makes it even more complex. So please keep them in your prayers. Let's take a moment to re prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come into our midst. Come down to where we are and speak your word of hope, a word that lightens our darkness, that strengthens our weakness, that grants peace to the chaos in our hearts and minds. Come down and be among us. Especially today, God, be with Sharon. Um, be, with the, be with the families of those who have died. Be, God, with, with us in this time. Speak to us through your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now have our opening hymn. God, our creator, you have created us in your image and have placed within us a longing so great that we hardly dare own it. Give us the courage to dare to hunger for you with our whole being, so that in hungering for you, we live for you, loving you in our every breath, thought, and action. Come to our longing, O God of eternal joy. O Christ, you are the immense longing of God, a longing which calls and embarrasses us in its vulnerability and entirety, a longing that delights and terrifies us. Come, 
Come and confront our poor love with the humility and recklessness of your self-giving so that we may abandon all that binds us and anoint you with the fearless surrender of our lives. Come to, the, come to our longing, O God, of eternal joy. O holy life-giving Spirit, you are the joy of heaven that longs to fill us, the might of God that longs to empower us, the brokenness of God that longs to restore us. Come, come to our fears and our reluctance, our apathy and our cowardice, for you can bring life to the deserts of our hearts. You can bring song to the darkest night. Come to our longing, O God, of eternal joy. And now we will hear the first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O oh God, for this evergreen crown that marks our days of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light the first candle on this wreath, rouse us from sleep that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes from all the saints and angels. Enlighten us with your grace and prepare our hearts to welcome him with joy. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah, chapter 64. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the heavens quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us 
and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not exceedingly, do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thank you to God. The Holy Gospel from the 13th chapter according to Mark's Gospel. Jesus said, In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but... My words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The gospel of the Lord, praise to you, O Christ. Please join me as we pray. We strain to keep our eyes open, O God, but there is so much around us that makes us want to close them. There are so many things going on inside of us that cause us to be turned up, turned over, that cause us to be shaken and stirred. God, it is sometimes hard enough to even open our eyes in the morning when we wake, much less to keep them awake all day long. Lord God, lighten our darkness. Encourage our despair. Encourage us in our despair. As we, encourage us, Lord Christ, in the face of despair, that we may know your peace. Grant us your grace for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep awake. Keep alert. Stay open. On the page, it reads like a challenge because in our lives, it feels like a challenge to keep awake, to stay awake, to be open. 
it's a challenge because so often in the past we have opened ourselves, we have opened our hearts, we have opened our lives, we have waited and waited and it seems like nothing is happening. It seems like we are more apt to get our hearts broken than we are to get them filled if we keep awake, stay awake, to be open. And yet, this is what Jesus calls on us to do. And before we were around, he told the first disciples this. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples, um, well, they're not the brightest bulbs on the Christmas tree, let us say. The disciples in Mark's gospel are um, a little slow of heart. Oh, they may say to Jesus whatever he wants to hear, but they may not always live it out. The disciples often in Mark's gospel don't get it. They don't get what Jesus is saying, and they don't get maybe all the time who Jesus is. And even the one who in the middle of the gospel gets who Jesus is will deny him three times. But in this passage, later than the middle of the gospel of Mark, Jesus is speaking directly to the community to whom this gospel is written. The Gospel of Mark was not just written for the d -d disciples, the twelve, but also, in fact, all of us. In the, in the first century, in, before the Gospel of Mark was written, the temple was destroyed. And with that went all of their hopes and dreams. And with that went all of their all of their joy and all of their praise for it was in that space that people would gather not only for community and for all sorts of other things but also to worship they would gather because they knew that while it might feel otherwise out in the world there the holy of holies existed there god was present there they knew that they were held in the hands of a gracious god not necessarily out in the world. In the world, so many things were sort of swirling around. So when the temple was destroyed, everything to them felt really scary and really hard. And they were looking, oh, were they looking for a sign that things were to turn around. I love this gospel and I love this lesson because it does not pull any punches. It's not soft around the edges, but it meets us in the cold, hard reality of our lives. It meets us where we are broken and where we are afraid and where we are longing and where we are fatigued, brothers and sisters. We are fatigued and in this gospel Jesus gets it he gets at and gets to us by naming our brokenness what are you waiting for in these days what are you longing for in these days? What has you afraid to keep awake, keep alert, to stay open? Where has your heart, how has your heart been broken into a million little pieces underneath our sarcasm and our Diet Coke. Where do we long for healing and new life?
this lesson drives us to hope. Not hope that that will blink our eyes and everything will just be better tomorrow, but the hope that we will not be alone in it. The hope that sees clearly the struggles that we have and that makes a promise to lighten our darkness, to strengthen our weakness, to heal our brokenness, to love even when what is before us or in us feels unlovable or unacceptable to God or anyone else. In 2007, in the summer of 2007, I lived and studied in the community of Wittenberg, Germany, which is where Martin Luther was a monk and where he preached a gazillion sermons to people who were farmers and laborers and, um, and taught at the seminary. I was there studying and writing around Luther's theology. I had received a grant from the Lutheran Church in Germany, so I went. And while I was there, uh, I attended a party, because in Germany, that's how you get to know people. So I went to a party and stood up against the wall because I was quiet and shy. Well, not really. But I was still there. I was, I was kind of quiet. And somebody came up to me and said, Hey, Paul, this person over here, you should talk with them. I said, Why? They said, Well, just, just talk with her for a few minutes. So I did. I went up to her and we started to talk. Her name is Ina. She was a cardiac care nurse in the hospital behind the Berlin Wall for much of her life. But when I had met her just recently before that, her husband and kids abandoned her. They abandoned her. They didn't want anything to do with her because she had decided that she wanted to be baptized, that she wanted to live her life as a Christian. And in a, in a world where that was not cool, her husband and kids wanted no part. So she asked if we could meet together the next day, and so we did. We met at an open-air ice cream shop, a gelato stand actually, not very far away from the castle church where Luther nailed the 95 Theses, or is said to have done that. And Ina told me her story. But before she told me her story, when I arrived, she had her Bible open. She said, will you read this story with me? It was a story of the prodigal son, the story of two sons, one who, who was the oldest, who did everything right, who did everything to the letter, did everything they had to do and more. Can you tell where I am in the birth order in my family? I am the oldest. I love the oldest in this story, but I also love the youngest who, in fact, is completely, completely lost his mind and has wasted his father's wealth and thus kind of said, Father, I wish you weren't around anymore, and who totally squandered everything. And one day he woke up and found himself in a pig pen, and he noticed how the pigs were eating better than he was. And he said, you know, my father, I wonder if my father would take me back even as a slave. I don't deserve to be his son, but maybe I could be his slave and, or servant. And so he went back and the father saw him coming and dropped everything and ran to him and grabbed hold of him and put a ring on his finger and restored him back into relationship. The fact that the older son did not appreciate. The older son thought that was unfair. Ina and I read this story, and she said, this is a great story, but it is not my story. I said, well, why isn't it your story? She said, God would never 
run and meet me and restore me to him. I d- I've, been, I've done such bad things. I said, well, what have you done? So for the next hour and a half, and I know this because the bell on the church tower rang every 15 minutes, for an hour and a half, she told me everything she could think of that tore her away from God, that made her think that she did not deserve God's love or grace, that made her think that she was outside of any hope that she might have of receiving God's love and forgiveness. So I listened for a long time. And then at the end, she sort of folded her arms like this and leaned back and said, so, Paul, what do you have to say about that? (laughs) As if I wouldn't have something to say. She didn't know that then. I took her hand and I said, Ina, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you, you are forgiven. She paused. She said, I've never heard that before. Say it again. I said, you are loved by God. She said, say it again. You are forgiven by God. Say it again. You are held in God's arms. Say it again. God would run across the world to wrap you in his grace, to wrap you in his arms. You are his. He is yours. Say it again. We did this back and forth for another 45 minutes. And after we were in this open, as I said, this gelato stand, this open outdoor gelato stand and after a while people started to gather and they watched us like they were watching a tennis match you are loved say it again you are forgiven say it again back and forth and back and forth and at the end her head dropped and she began to cry and she said I really have not ever heard that before every once in a while I think of her because as open and as honest as she was I wonder if we know that a little more than we want to admit in our own lives. So we feel that we're outside the love and grace of God for all the bad things that we've done or not done, or the good things that we've not done. I don't know where you are today, or all that you've been facing, but I do know this that Jesus Christ always comes to us and Jesus Christ always comes for us and Jesus Christ loves you with wild abandon and Jesus Christ forgives you completely and totally and Jesus Christ meets you with your brokenness and heals you and Jesus Christ fills your despairing heart with hope. Jesus Christ is your Lord. For Ina, this meant that she was baptized. For Ina, this meant that for a long time afterwards, I'd receive an email from her that only had in the subject line, say it again. And so I'd respond and say, you are loved by God, you are forgiven by God, you are healed by God, and I'd just go on and on, just back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. The story in today's gospel could scare the, scare the heck out of us, honestly. And I understand for some it does. But it all, it, it's all built around the kind of God that has us. The kind of God that has us isn't going to stand back and treat us poorly because we haven't done what we should or we've done something we shouldn't. The God we have loves us so much that he drops it all. He drops it all and runs to us. Runs to us. So whether we are awake or asleep, whether we are alert or not, whether we are open or not, Jesus Christ is right there at every step, in every breath, at every turn. Jesus Christ is with us. And because of that, it is 
no longer possible not to have hope. Not today, not tomorrow, not even at the end. For you are his, and he is yours forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. We pray for the ministry we share in Christ's name. Open our hearts to your call for justice, peace, and healing. Attune us to the needs of the world as you draw near. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for this planet in need of restoration, for devastated habitats, polluted waters, thawing ice, blazing fires, swelling floods, and long-lasting droughts. Renew the face of the earth and our relationship to it. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for all people who care for others in our community and around the world. Fill them with compassion and the power to respond with justice for those who are oppressed, with welcome for those who are excluded, and with relief for those who suffer. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for people who are in crisis as the seasons change, for those without homes facing severe weather, for those who are unemployed or underemployed, and for those in poverty or facing food insecurity. Relieve their burdens, sustain their bodies, and ease their minds. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for the people in our families and congregations who live with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, addiction, and other invisible illnesses. We pray for Clarence, Yvonne, Charlie, Sandy, Carolyn, Milton, Norm, Joyce, Donald, Renata, Brian, Warren, Tom, Tom, Roger, Judy, Zelda, Leonard, and Lucille, Alvin, Flossie, Ruth, Gail, and the family and loved ones of the late Larry Hausman and of Cynthia. Hear us, O oh God. Ease their suffering and support them when they struggle. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for the lives and witnesses of those who died while waiting for justice, peace, and healing. Those whose names we know and those whose names we know are known only to you. Sustain all who still yearn for the completion of your redeeming work. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I want to thank the congregation and the community for all the ways that you have shown support for our ministry 
and for our continued ministry in this time. Know that, know that your support makes ministry possible. So we give thanks to God for you and pray for you and your family in these times. Know that our love and prayers are with you. Let us pray. Generous God, you have created all that is, and you provide for us in every season. Bless all that we offer, that through these gifts, the world will receive your blessing. In the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now sing the first verse of Soon and Very Soon. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. God bless and keep you this week.